okay uh, everyone again welcome to the uh, linux and the programming languages course the lts um, and today we will be continuing our discussion on the linux networking uh, today is lecture 7 on the linux networking um, we started learning about the distributed file system we learned about the sun nfs uh, file system now we will be learning today the afs or the andrew file system um, this is the second half and then we will do some comparison between the NFS and the AFS and then finally we will look at the NIS which is the network information system um, and that will pretty much conclude the, the networking portion of um, uh, this course. So before I start about uh, start talking about the AFS or the Android file system let me summarize what we discussed um, last time. Um, we actually started talking about the distributed file system or remote file system. Um, some of the benefits of the remote file system are one is reliability. Um, so again, um, this goes back to like I mean, um, not many people, not many people carry multiple copies of the data. And um, if you are carrying multiple copies of the data, it's, it doesn't, it's not like a much protection. So. Um, um, you need to have like that kind of a reliable mechanism and then the second thing is like the backups are very nice and the, especially like I mean if the backups are done in a um, temperature controlled humidity controlled room with the fire suppressed um, facilities um, and the time travel is nice too meaning like you can go back in time and actually capture some of the data things like that it's also like uh, pretty nice. Um, the second aspect of uh, the remote file system is uh, the sharing, it allows the multiple users to access data, um, but you need to provide authentication system, the security becomes an issue there, but in general it allows this sharing, so again that is another benefit of the remote file system. Uh, we actually talked about several um, um, key terminologies like transparency, um, uh, things like that. So. Again, it all goes back to these benefits uh, or what uh, the remote file system um, gives. The other benefit is the scalability. Um, again, buying large disks are cheaper, so centralized large disks for multiple users is, is a good thing. Um, locality of reference, I think, again. So, this is uh, one thing is um, we do not use all the files all the time uh, in a single day. So, why do we need to carry everything in expensive portable storage? Might as well have it in remote files and access only the files that we need. So, again, that is another big benefit of a remote file system. Um, and then finally, the auditability, which is um, essentially we can um, make sure we know um, who did or who submitted the data, what they submitted, when. Uh, with the central storage it is much more easier um, that we can get to that. Um, so there are all these benefits uh, this is what we talked about in the distributed file system. Then we looked at the NFS uh, file system itself, uh, the architecture is fairly simple it uses a stateless model for, or for the server, all the information about a particular files are stored in the client side. Um, the client has this uh, NFS client, um, the application program accesses um, just like um, it is a local file uh, through a virtual file system. Uh, the virtual file system understands whether it is part of the local file, the Unix file system or it is a remote file in this, in, this, in that case it actually mounts those files as a remote file. And then it communicates to the through the network to the NFS server on the server computer, and then gets that uh, data back into the application program. So from the application program, it still looks at looks like a local um, file itself, and uh, it uses this mounting as a way to get the files. So the NFS client keeps track of what goes on, where is the file, um, all those things. Um, <laughs> whereas the server side it is basically a stateless um, uh, machine, so the advantage is that you can add as many clients as possible 
still you don't lose any performance um, edge basically or the performance itself does not degrade um, by accessing. So this is all we saw basically like how the unit system call works and then how the um, operation uh, happens. Now let us look at uh, the summary on uh, NFS the so the network file system um, again it is basically it is a work group network file service um, kind of the protocol um, and any Unix machine can become a server. Uh, and it is fairly easy to, easy to set up a server uh, for the NFS on any Unix machine. The machines can be both a client as well as a server. So some files on my disk and some files on the other side and then um, everybody in the group can access all these files uh, easily. Um, but as we saw there are some serious trust issues, some scaling problems that we saw. The stateless file server model is goes only up to some point basically it is only a partial success. So now let us look at another file system which is completely different from the NFS or essentially like I mean um, it uses certain other concepts to uh, build this uh, remote file system. Let us look at that that is the Andrew file system. So again um, one um, similarity between the AFS and the NFS is that both provide transparent access to the remote shared files for Unix programs running on workstations. Um, and similar to the client server model uh, what, what we saw in the NFS, the AFS is also implemented as two software components that exist at the unit, Unix processes. Uh, they are called WISE and Beam. So let us look at the picture on this one. So here you have all these different workstations with its own Unix kernel. There are some user programs. Um, it also has what is called this VNet, which is actually a process. Now, um, in the NFS, we had the NFS server as a separate file system, basically. So, or it was actually like down here. Uh, whereas the VNet is actually a process that is running on the Unix kernel just like a user program. Um, so and then all these uh, programs are running and then the server side you can see that WISE is also a process or a program that is running on top of the Unix kernel and there are n number of files. So these programs themselves communicate and make sure that what is there in the file system is um, uh, given to the user. So just a simple uh, contrast between the pictures you know, if you look at this picture versus uh, this picture here the NFS client was under the file system as a particular file. So somehow or somewhat static you can say um, and then even the NFS server was also a, another file which is under the virtual file system again a static and how they are linked together. So that is why like we use all these. Um, the NFS protocol itself to link these files whereas in a Android file system actually the Venus and the Wise are programs that are being executed so they are processes so and then the program actually the user program communicates through this process to get to the various file systems and get the data back to the, um, the program that is running. So in the Andrews, Andrew file system case the files are available to the user processes running on the workstations um, are either local or shared. So um, and the local files are handled as the normal unit files they are stored in the workstations disk itself and are available only to the local user processes. The shared files are stored on servers and copies of them are cached in local uh, disks so again it allows that cop the caching mechanism. Um, the namespace seen by the user process um, that we will show in the next uh, picture. So again in this one you can see that actually um, when you have the shared one they are actually shown as symbolic links 
between the uh, those uh, files and that is how it knows that okay that is the remote file. So, the Unix kernel in each of the workstation uh, and server is a modified version of the BSD Unix which is the Berkeley systems um, Unix um, and essentially the modifications are designed to intercept the file commands which is essentially the open and the close and some other file system commands as well um, and when they refer to this uh, shared memory and then pass them to the Venus process in the client computer. Um, so, essentially like I mean the Venus uh, intercepts these so submits to the wise and then that wise process it to the Venus of the client computer get the information and then submits back to the, um, the, the process that is looking for this information. So, here uh, a quick um, um, set up basically like I mean in the the, the picture of the system call intersection itself. So here, the the user program calls um, it generates a Unix file system call, goes into the Unix kernel. It knows that actually it is not the, the local disk access, but it's actually a remote file access. So those non-local file operations are sent to Venus, which actually captures that and then communicates to Wise, and then goes to the server and then gets the that information brings it back to the user control user program. So let us look at this uh, process in little bit detail. So here the user process is open and we know this uh, command the open with file name and the more. Once the user process initiates this um, command the Unix actually has this code which is the uh, if the file name refers to the file in the the, uh, the shared file space, pass the request to Venus. Otherwise, just open the local file and return the file to the user process. And so, the result of this operation will be a description. So now, let's look at what happens when this um, uh, file system or the file that is uh, file name that is requesting is not in the local file but it is actually a shared file. So now it, it the request is sent to Venus the Venus actually checklist um, of files in the local cache if it is not present um, or there is no valid callback promise send the request of the file to the wise server that is the custodian of the volume containing this file. So, and if it finds the file through so either a call back from the wise or otherwise, basically, the um, if it is in the local cache or there is a callback promise, then the place the copy of the file in the local file system, enter its name in the local cache list, and return the local name back to the unit. So it goes back to the kernel and then goes back. Now, when the Venus makes a call to Wise, essentially Wise reads this call and says, "Okay, I have this file in my file system, so I will transfer that file and the callback promise to the workstation, which is requesting this. Log that callback promise and then basically exit at, at that point. So once that file gets transferred back." then this is basically like the copy is in the local cache so that now it can be served. So now let us look at uh, a read pointer essentially so for reading a file descriptor the buffer and the length this is not an issue basically now it does not go to Venus or the wise because the Venus already placed or the yeah the Venus already plays that file in the Unix system as a local file in the cache. So now the read operation is just reading that uh, then it is a normal operation like this uh, normal read operation on a localized file system. 
Now if it is a right operation, now again it does not go into the Venus or the wise, but it just does the operation um, in the local file system itself, the local copy. Now the interesting thing is when you close that particular file, when you close the file, it closes the local copy and it also notifies the Venus that the file has been closed. So that's when now the Venus will kick in and then essentially it looks for if the local copy is changed. If it is changed, then that it will send that copy to the Y server. Um, and Y server now puts it in its file system. It, re it replaces the file content and send the call back to all the clients that are holding that um, that file, that callback promise. Saying that okay, this file is modified now. You need to modify your local cache file. So you can think of this system basically: the Venus, the network, and the Wise as processes running, monitoring what is going on in the file, and uh, communicating back and forth when the files change, or if some other Venus process is requesting a file, it passes that file. So um, think of there's, there are two systems here. One is um, the user process and the user kernel, the other one is the Venus and the white for uh, systems. So, and then they both have a shared local cache essentially. Even though here the shared memory is actually supported in white, we can think of them as updating a local um, cache that um, essentially, like, I mean, that's your area where both of these processes can gain access to. So this that may be a better way to understand how the whole thing works. In the um, contrasting with the NFS, you would have seen that actually um, the processes are pretty much the same. The file systems themselves are, have a separate basically, and so the there is a localized file system, and then there's a remote file system, and basically like the common link is. Through the mounting and unmounting of files. So now let's look at some more uh, some more important components of the the wise service um, interface. Um, so this is basically like the server side, essentially like again what shown what is shown here. So there is a fetch command. Which returns an attribute and a data um, for a given file ID. Um, so this essentially, like I mean, um, returns the the attribute um, and also records any callback promises on on that particular file from that um, the centralized file server back to the client, um, back to the the Venus program. The second command is the store file ID attribute data. This updates the attributes essentially and um, and the contents of a specific. This is what uh, the Venus will give the command once there is a closed file. Um, it basically like then sends the, the store command to uh, the 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 vice to make sure that the contents are updated. Then there is another command called create that returns a file ID. This creates a new file and records a callback promise on it and then sends this um, file ID to the requesting process. The remove file ID removes a, a specified file and then we have set lock file ID with the mode. This sets the lock on the specified file. And uh, the mode of the lock may be shared or exclusive. The locks that are not removed will expire after 30 minutes. And release lock again uh, with the file ID unlocks the specified file or the directory. And remove callback for a file ID also informs the server that the Venus process has flushed a file from the cache. And break callback uh, file ID. This is made by the the Y server to the Venus process. It cancels a callback promise on a relevant file. 
so in summary the AFS is a worldwide file system so if you look at um, the structure here the servers hold this file system here uh, and you can pretty much um, any any other files that are there it is mirrored under that uh, this particular file system. So you can almost think of this as a worldwide file system. So NFS may be like one per um, um, network here the AFS is just it is just only one that is needed and um, also like since all these callbacks and all of them are tagged and basically like all the file management is done internally it is it has a very good security as well as uh, good scaling and as you see basically um, the names themselves they do not have to collide basically it is actually it is a global namespace essentially because the files themselves are copied back and forth into various uh, clients um, as a management. So again um, you can think of this as basically like uh, the server still keeps track of the state of the overall network at all times. So this is not a stateless server as we have seen in the NFS um, system and it is a professional server infrastructure per cell so essentially like I mean you you have to um, be trained on this. So you cannot just set it up just like the NFS where any Unix server can be set up as a or any Unix client can be set up as a server. Um, it is only like about 190 AFS cell um, between 2005 and 2011. The 8 are in uh, CMU and 15 are in Pittsburgh. Again in this one again it is a no write conflict essentially like I mean kind of that is a protocol that is implied because one and one particular uh, client checks out a file um, the others may not get the right um, access uh, this is only like a partial success because you know you have like there is a time lag between when the server updates the file um, and then it communicates uh, to all the clients to also like change the file. So there are still some issues um, in, in with respect to how we can um, create the file and model the file. So the key differences between the AFS and NFS um, essentially uh, with NFS the different clients can mount the same file system in different places. Whereas AFS is just one system for the entire planet. So again this goes back to the basic differences basically like client every client sees the file system as its own unique file system in a NFS environment truly by replicating the file mount points. Whereas in an AFS system the centralized server stores all the files and basically the processes themselves communicate to the centralized server in order to gather those files. So that is one of the key differences between the NFS and the AFS and um, unlike NFS uh, the NFS actually uses this ETC file systems um, as a mount point um, and this is where there is a map between the local directory name and the remote file system. The AFS does all the mapping at the server. So this is a tremendous advantage this whole tremendous advantage um, of making the served file space location completely independent. So everything is controlled by the server so the clients have seldom uh, any anything to do with um, that uh, anything to do with changing the namespace. So there is no like namespace collision um, and also the this file space location is also completely independent because the server is the one that controls where the particular goes in uh, where the particular file goes into. So you can actually move it around 
and still you won't see any issues basically because uh, the server still has the mapping uh, of where the files are. Whereas um, in an NFS, um, which is the the next one basically, so, um, the when when you change a file, essentially the the in an NFS. Um, Essentially, you need to change the etc file systems file on the 20 clients. Um, even if you are taking like just taking the slash home offline, um, or while you moved it between the servers. With the AFS, you have to just simply move the AFS volume, which constitutes the slash home between the servers. You do this online while the others are actively using file and. Um, and without no disruption to their work because the changing whatever you are doing you are going to send a call back uh, notice to the those uh, so those clients uh, via the Ys and the Venus uh, to just change the, the the notification basically. So in fact um, when you are changing a file you do not even have to notify the, the Y server because when they access um, to either close the file or um, open a new file in that particular directory, the mapping is already um, in place in the server to go to that particular directory. Um, and then the regarding the security, AFS is far more secure than NFS. Um, it uses this special authentication called Kerberos. We talked about this Kerberos briefly in the last uh, lecture. I just wanted to give you some more details on the Kerberos. Uh, some of you may have already known about Kerberos. Kerberos actually provides a centralized authentication server uh, to authenticate users uh, to servers and servers to users. And this relies on the conventional encryption. And it does not make use of the public key encryption. Um, so there are some additional things, basically, like uh, there are um, some other encryption services that it uses. Um, so the basic idea behind Kerberos um, is essentially it, um, there's a server where you send the um, your so the as a client or a user. The user data is sent to that server, which keeps track of which users are authorized to use that particular request. So, and then it sends back the authentication information. So, once you receive the authentication information with that certificate, you can go into a um, server or for a given service. And, and while you are doing that, even the server is also authenticated by the same server uh, by the same uh, Kerberos uh, process. Which says that okay, that server is authenticated to actually now receive your uh, service request and deliver the service. So the server gets the same thing. So this is what you see, like I mean, in most of the um, websites when they say basically, like okay, the certificate is now expired. Do you want to um, redo the certificate? Essentially, like I mean, the certificate is the authentication provided by the Kerberos server. So with that um, we conclude the distributed file systems now let us look at the network information system which is essentially an application of um, all the things that we talked about which is both the DSS, DNS everything put together. So a network information system provides a generic database access uh, facilities such as password and groups files to all the hosts in a given network so that the network will appear as a single system with the same account on all the hosts so you log in from any of the hosts so today like when you have a machine and uh, you are logging in as yourself in that machine tomorrow you go into your friend's uh, office and you try to log in as your uh, with your um, authentication information what if the computer does not let you access um, and it appears different since all the computers are connected in the same network do not you think that um, that also needs to take in your information and give you the access 
I think that is what the NIS provides. So, it basically distributes the hostname information from slash etc host to all the machines on the network. So, from for a given user, the client, everything uh, including the network and all the network um, uh, access points, everything appears as a single network. So it doesn't matter whether it's a subnet of a subnet of a subnet, and all these subnets are grouped together. The NIS provides a single access or uniform access across this network. The the network information structure is based on remote procedure calls. Uh, this we saw already. Um, it comprises a server, a client-side library. And several administrative tools. Originally, the NIS was uh, started by uh, Sun as a Yellow Pages system. So it used to be called Yellow Pages, but then British Telecom had uh, exclusively exclusive rights on this term Yellow Pages. So Sun had to discontinue the usage of uh, the Yellow Pages. So then they named it as uh, NIS. So that's the origin of. Uh, the network information system, but uh, the YP is still there in a lot of the commands, such as YP serve, YP bind, etc. These are the basic uh, uh, commands for building a network information system. So the NIS support replication with the slave servers. We saw that basically, I mean, that's what it that does. Um, and essentially, like any the changes in master server need to be pushed using YP push command to the slaves, if any. And it uses the Berkeley database for fast lookup. We saw the very first thing is essentially it's a database based um, um, system for uh, authenticating password and uh, um, the group files. And uh, each file might be translated into multiple um, network information system maps. Uh, so this is using the ETC password. So you can have like password by name, password by user ID, things like that. So um, various uh, forms of authentication information can be provided. So now let's look at uh, how to set up an NIS server. So essentially, like I mean, we use these commands: yum install yp serve. Then um, we provide a yp domain name, like yp domain name Linux is better. Then we start the yp serve process, which is in the slash etc slash init dot d. And uh, if you want to set up a master process, then we say basically yp init dash m. And for the slaves, we say basically it's uh, IP init dash s and provide the master's uh, IP address. Then we essentially like um, read from the um, yp dot config. Um, essentially, like I mean, that's where we set it up as this domain. So this is what is the outcome essentially, which is the yp dot on. Where we set up this domain, uh, Linux is better, um, and basically, like I mean, now you have the, um, the the configuration defined. Now you can actually start the process, which is using the yp bind command, and uh, we just say basically yp bind start, and then it starts the overall process. So the YP serve start essentially starts the NIS server domain, and um, even when you um, uh, give the master command, that will prompt you to add the slave command, and Control D is to end, and then finally the the NIS uh, client daemon itself is started by the YP bind command, um, and this needs to be run both in the server side as well as the, the client side. And then to verify, um, we use the 
the P S uh, minus A U X W which is essentially like we want to make sure that uh, the Y P processes are running and then Y P which is another command uh, Y P cat Y P servers uh, essentially um, and then Y P cat password and Y P cat group. So these are all essentially uh, commands to get the information regarding the NIS system. I would like you to actually use some of these commands in your um, workstation and see what is the result. And also, you can also um, type in man for each of these commands. Essentially, the YP which, YP cat, um, etc., to find out more information on how these commands work. And to run the NIS server automatically. Um, the slash etc slash sysconfig slash network needs to be updated with the NIS domain. So basically, just record the NIS domain equal to the, the domain name, and then the we give these commands: check config yp serve on, check config yp bind. So again, you need to set up the yp serve, do the binding, and then essentially like um, um, if uh, want to do like the um, other services to be offered so for example the YP password is one of them which is um, you can do the check config YP password make that also on so that you can give the users to do these commands and uh, YP ch sh is also like another one that is the change shell command if you want to provide the users with that facility then you can basically turn on that feature also. So now the other thing is how do we sync data between the master and the slave in our servers. So from the server we can just uh, provide the YP transfer command um, with the map name. Uh, from the server side sorry from the slave side we just provide the YP transfer command and from the server side we do the YP push command. Uh, we already saw this YP push essentially to push that information back to the, the all the slaves. So any new map changes are pushed through these two commands um, either from the slaves to the server or servers to the slave. And uh, some sites use their backend databases and uh, make NIS servers fetch the data from this central source. So they have uh, some backend databases already defined and then um, it basically like the NIS servers fetch the data from this source. Um, essentially, like they, they use uh, some cron job to do this one. Uh, for example, this is a transfer twelve per day, which is uh, basically every other hour. It basically transfers that, or they can use a cron job, which is a transfer YP transfer one per day, one per hour, which is every hour it transfers that. So here essentially like I mean this is a just a sequence of command that you, you can try it um, in your um, machines which is set up the YP domain name uh, called Linux dot ease dot better and then um, essentially you configure the, the, the look for the, uh, the config file which is YP dot config um, and then um, you basically do the YP bind. Uh, start then the NIS um, to the each of these lines the password and the group essentially and then um, use the various um, commands to debug which is the YP which uh, YP cat password um, and then try to lo log in into a user account. And then this is the something that we saw basically like how to run it um, automatically. And then uh, to change the password on the NIS server, it's the YP password command, uh, similar to password. Uh, so this essentially changes the password across all the um, the clients so that uh, 
that is through that uh, YP transfer process it pushes into the service and then to change the login shell in the, on the NAS server is a change shell command with the YP in front. So this actually concludes uh, the topic um, uh, for today. Um, I think uh, we will begin the programming uh, classes the next one. So today in in the server um, uh, in the um, uh, Linux uh, networking uh, class we saw two items one is the Android file system we now know what is an Android file system and how to contrast between the Android file system and the NFS that we learned uh, in the last class um, and then um, also we learned about the NIS how to set up NIS and um, also like what are the key points about NIS and why do we need it. Uh, again thank you very much for attending and thank you um, um, see you in the next class thanks. Hello sir. Yeah, hey Sandeep. Okay, so done with the class, right sir? Yeah, so today it was only like about 40 minutes, right? Uh, around 41 minutes, right? Okay. Hmm. Okay, so uh, let, me send, let me send you the slides by uh, the day in today here, like within 4 to 5 hours. Okay. okay. So starting the pearl basic, right sir? Yeah. Okay, I will send it. Sir, uh, by the way, like uh, while sending that particular thing, I will be sending my contact number to you also. Okay. Okay. So, like, if anything urgent, like you can just call me and just uh, just put me a message. Sure, sure. And uh, you know what? Uh, even next class, let's start at ten thirty. When we can plan? Sir? Same thing. Right now, we'll go with like uh, the Wednesday and Monday, Sunday. 